In short, any problem that I've ever had, drinking was pretty much involved. Didn't have a care in the world. And then, you know, found opiates. I think I really just had fear of getting sober. I think that was, my, like, I didn't know how to live any other way. Drugs and alcohol were my solution. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Addiction Talk. We are excited tonight to have a special guest with us. Many of you may have seen her on the hit show, Ready to Love. She was one of the stars of that show. She also is an attorney and has her own podcast with Rashid, her boo from the show, um, which is called Ages and Stages. But we're excited to have you here tonight, Simone. Thank you so much first for joining us to share your story publicly. Thank you for having me. This is the first time I'm going to be publicly sharing my story. Yeah. So, you know, Simone, I think a lot of people, you know, when you're doing reality TV, they feel like they know you and they're getting a chance to see an inside look at your life. But this is something like you said that you're sharing publicly for the first time. What led you to say this is the time to open up about something that's very personal to me and to share it with the world? Well, I think first I decided I was ready to share because I feel like when you keep it to yourself, there's a lot, well, there's a lot of stigma attached to it. And initially I felt a lot of shame, so much shame, but I've worked through that. And I just want other people to know that one, Adderall, which was my addiction, it's a real thing, but also that this is what addict looks, addicts look like. Sometimes they're pretty, sometimes they look completely healthy, you know, and you never know. And because there may be someone else like me who's out there struggling as well. Do you feel like a lot of people had no idea and were surprised, even, you know, family and friends that you have shared this with? Because like you said, people have a perception in their mind of what someone looks like when they're struggling with addiction. And when we look at you, you're an attorney, you were on TV, you just had all these things going for you. So were people surprised or what did you find the reaction was initially just sharing it? Um, actually, people were surprised, but very, very supportive. And part of the reason where I, because I, part of the reason why I became more comfortable sharing is I grew to learn that 40 to 50% of attorneys struggle with addiction. So I'm actually really normal. <laughs> I'm a very normal addiction. And um, I think the statistics, they, they say that usually dentists struggle the most then attorneys and doctors or there's there's some um all three of us run in the tops and it's related to the stress it's related to the the feeling of the need to overachieve all the time so i was very happy to see that i especially in this day and age where mental health is uh is being discussed more openly i actually received a lot of support well, I hope, like you said tonight, just sharing your story, and we're going to delve right into that, that someone will feel like they're not alone. It can happen Absolutely. to anyone. Like you said, they, you know, they look like people that you don't even think because we have this perception in our mind. So let's go back to your story, Simone. So when did you first start taking Adderall? What made you start taking it? And how did you, you know, even begin to take this medication? Absolutely. I started taking it eight years ago. After, and that was when I was studying for the Texas bar. So I didn't take it at all in law school or undergrad. Um, actually, after law school, I took the New York and New Jersey bar at the same time and passed first time. And then three years later, I decided to move to Texas, go home to Texas where my family was. And so I had to take it all over again. And I was just so distracted. Um, it's different when you're taking it and you're working at the same time. So I had less time to study and more distractions. And what I did, what happened was I remembered back in law school when we were take, uh, doing bar prep and we were studying. And it was this girl who was very rich. She let everyone know she lived on Park Avenue in New York. I went to Cornell and she let everyone know about Park Avenue. And she was on the law review, which is like honor roll in Dean's List. And I thought, and she was telling us about how she takes Adderall and how it helps her. And I thought to myself, you know, I'm struggling studying for the Texas bar. And that girl in law school was very, very stupid. She was very dumb. And she made honor roll on this stuff. So if this dumb girl could get on the honor roll, well, it could surely help me pass the Texas bar. 
That's what I thought. <laughs> Whoa. Okay. So that's a whole story in itself. So you saw this girl, you're like, well, she's not that bright in your opinion. So you're like, if this helped her to get on the honor roll, then there must be something to this, which is interesting. Do you think that was something that had been, you know, running rampant or in the lawyer circle that, hey, this could help you? Oh, or was this something that. that you started to hear a lot about? Oh, yes, absolutely. Now, in the black law student circle, we didn't do that. I think it comes from our culture. Um, we are, especially black children, are so quickly labeled ADD. And then the next solution is to throw on some medication. So my mom and many black mothers and black parents are very hesitant to medicate their children. Instead, they use non-medicinal ways, you know, to adjust behavior. So, but I learned that in law school, pretty much all the rich kids did it. They'd, um, and then as a result of being prescribed Adderall, they would get time and a half to take all their tests. So whereas I had to get my test done in three hours, they would first get a private room because that's what you're uh, allowed when you take Adderall. And secondly, you're allowed uh, one and a half times more time. So I only had three hours. They got four and a half hours for the same test and were graded and we're graded on a curve. So mm. I had to compete with these other students. And so it was very rampant and it's, it's rampant now in college as well. And colleges these days, they grade on a curve. So when you know this is what your competition is doing, then there's a lot more pressure to do it as well. So you talk about that pressure. You're thinking about taking the bargain. You're feeling that pressure. You think back to this young woman who did it, who used it, and you're like, I'm going to try it. So what was it like when you started taking it? What did it feel like? What did you notice? Mm. So when you take it, the first time I took it, this is not encouragement for anybody out there. The first time I took it, I was so happy. I, I was taking it as I was studying for the bar. And it's, this was maybe like a, a five days before my exam. And I, I, I took it and I immediately started to feel like, whew, I love the law. I love the law. Let's study. Let's study. Mm. Oh, I'm going to pass. Oh, I'm going to. So then you feel excited about studying. Mm. And I could study nonstop for like six hours without needing a break. And then I lost weight on it because it suppresses your appetite. So I'm looking super cute and I'm being very productive. So I thought, this is great. There could be nothing wrong with this. Why didn't I do this years ago? You know, I could have absolutely beat that girl on law, um, to law review or on roll or any of those things. So part of the problem was it actually makes you happy to study. Go figure. Um, and so I think that's why it's one of the number one most abused drugs for attorneys um, is because it makes you so much productive. And then I, I studied and I would receive the information um, more quickly, but I would also have a more deeper understanding of it. It got to the point where I'd call my private tutor and I'd have, I'd, be, I'd go over a few last topics before the bar and that private tutor said, stop calling me. You got mm. this. You're overthinking. So one of the things it also does is it makes you overthink, which mm. ultimately is what got me into problems is I became hyper, um, hyper focused. Yeah. Which is a whole nother issue. But yeah. So if in, initially it made me super productive and happy to study. <laughs> Whoa. So you're so initially, and I think that's what happens with a lot of people who start taking a drug or something like that. Initially it's the high or the feeling or whatever. So how soon into doing this? I know you said this was like an eight year process before you actually sought treatment for this. How soon into the eight years did you start to go? Hmm. Right. Well, actually, I started right. taking it in 2012 um, and then went to rehab in 16. So about in over about a four year span, I came to realize, OK, something isn't right. And I, I probably started to realize it in about 2015, which would have been about about three years in. And what made me realize it was because I couldn't function without it. So, for example, on non-work days, sometimes I would in, I would intentionally leave it at home and go to brunch with my girlfriends. Well, um, even though I wasn't working after a few hours, I'd be like, no, I got to stop at home. I got to go take at least half and then proceed with my day because it gave you this happy element. And then I also got to the point where I was, I had a homegirl who was staying with me 
I would give it to her and say, um, you know, I don't need these anymore. And she had asked me first. I was like, I don't need these anymore. And she was like, oh, okay, well, you know, I'll hold them for you. And she ended up taking my my whole pill bottle out of town with her for three days. And I was like so livid. I tried to make her mail them back to me because I couldn't go 24 hours without them. Uh, don't do that, guys. That's like apparently a federal offense. <laughs> um, so we did not mail them. But I just realized I couldn't function. I was irritable. I was cranky without it. And I was irritable and I was cranky with it. Mm. Because I wasn't sleeping. Mm -hmm. When you say you weren't sleeping, you started to notice that you couldn't go 24 hours. Were right. you staying up all night or how bad did it get? I'm just curious. Yeah. About that. At, the height of, of the, at the height of it, what was happening is and one of the other reasons why it took me so long to figure out I had a problem is because I never got it on the street. All of this is prescribed by my doctor. Mm. And I would go back into him maybe every three months and he'd ask me if I wanted to up my prescription. So I'd be like, sure, why not? And you can break them in half. So I figured he was like, oh, you can just break them in half if you feel like you don't need that much. Well, at the height of it, I was only sleeping five days a week. And that was because I would usually spend, stay up working, working on my cases, working on my client stuff overnight, at least twice a week. So I might... Um, sleep in my office um, Monday night and then I'd be so tired at the end of Tuesday I'd go home be knocked out and then Wednesday night be like oh well you slept too much yesterday do it again and then try and recoup on the weekends um, I was missing family events I was missing things I truly enjoyed because if I wasn't super focused on taking care of all of these other clients then I was dead sleep just missing out on life. And I was sick of that. Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting to me that the doctor actually wanted to continue to up your dose. Like, did he ever ask you like any questions or even no about the risks? And no, all, and what the only thing that would happen is I remember each time I go, now mind you, this was a PCP. I think that if I had been prescribed this by a psychiatrist, they absolutely would have asked more questions. But my PCP figured, you're intelligent, you're super smart, you're an attorney, you got this, you'll be fine. And I wasn't overusing it, so it wasn't like I was calling in to get my prescription filled beforehand. Um, so he just thought, hey, I'm just helping her be more productive. He never ever even said, hey, well, these are the symptoms of abuse or overuse because if i had known what those look like perhaps i would have gotten help or known to get help a lot earlier so but yeah go ahead no i think that's really interesting because the fact that they didn't tell you that and i think a lot of people may not be aware of that you said you know if it's coming from a pcp or different things like that and they're not saying hey this could potentially be an issue for you. You need to watch out for this. So if somebody were hearing your story, what would be the symptoms that you wish they had told you? Right. So the symptoms were hyper focus. I would be so hyper focused, for example, on writing a motion that I would spend an hour just making sure the margins and the bullets were perfect, but I wouldn't finish the motion on time. So you're so hyper focused on an aspect that you don't get your assignments done on time. Secondly is irritability. Oh, I was always cranky. I was always unhappy, crying all the time. Um, mean. Ooh, I was a mean son of a gun and depressed. Mm. Um, Adderall, there's an Adderall induced depression. It had gotten so bad at the height that I had to call my secretary and would ask her to come pick me up from my house to take me into the office. Because if not, I'd stay in bed all day. Mm. Yeah. And then overworking yourself as well. Overworking, overstudying. I remember sometimes I have same clothes on, same panties on the next day. I used to have to uh, keep a bag of clean panties in my drawer <laughs> just because I would sleep in my office so frequently. And, you know, when you have an idea of what an addict look like, looks like, you think, of, you know, you've got alcoholics where you know they're drunk. Um, or sloppy drunk. You've got, if they're, you know, cocaine or crackhead, they're, you, you know, they get super skinny. They have these different things. The problem is when you have an Adderall addiction, it makes you super um, effective. 
super mm. successful. So I was getting accolades and praise. For example, I'd be sending emails to my client at 2 a.m. because I wasn't asleep. And my client's like, oh, this is a great attorney. She's really working on my case. She's doing a great job. So the client's praising me. The guy mm. at the time I was dating was like, man, you never go into the gym and your body's awesome. Yeah, it's an appetite suppressor. I went mm -hmm. down to like 116 pounds. Today, I'm about 150. So you can just imagine it wasn't, it wow. wasn't good. But you're getting so much praise because you're productive. Physically, I looked good, but I was losing it. I was losing it. Mm -hmm. mm. You know, and you know what I think is so powerful about that is that here you are losing it. And to the outside world, they think you're you're rocking it, you know, and to 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 know that you had to kind of struggle with that internally without even really telling anybody what kind of was that breaking point then for you? Or did somebody come to you and notice something? No. And I, I always think I always thought that one, if it were an illegal drug, I absolutely would have realized I was addicted a lot earlier. But because it was a prescription, I kept thinking my doctor keeps giving it to me. Of course, it was a problem. He'd say something. Right. No, no one ever came to me. No one said anything to me until after. Um, what was my breaking point was that three of my coworkers died on Adderall within a year, three attorneys. And I was like, oh, no. One of my very close friends ended up on, he was up for five days on an Adderall binge and he ended up going back to his old uh, college and shooting it up, shooting up the college, hallucinations, all of those things I had. Yes. So I went to my mom one day and I just said, mom, I can't do this anymore. I'm losing my mind. And my mom said, <laughs> it was so sweet. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, just talking about it probably just brings back those feelings that you had. But it was so beautiful. My mom said, my mom said, oh, Mimi, honey, we were just waiting for you to ask for help. Now, mommy's been researching this, so I've got a lot of different options for you. Now, mommy knows you like to swim. Excuse me. She was like, now, mommy knows you like to swim. So they've got some places with swimming pools. Oh, and you've always liked horses since you were a little girl. They have places with equine therapy. So you just need to tell mommy what features you like and we'll get y'all set up. We can get you ready to go in two days. All I needed was 48 hours. And I was just like, really? Mm. And the other interesting thing about that is, you know, I still didn't know I had an addiction. Even mm. though I went and I said, I need help, I'm not okay. And she said, great, I've been looking for places. You know, I did not realize I had addiction until she dropped me off at rehab. <laughs> really? You don't- I just thought I was going to a place for depressed, sad girls. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you didn't even real, even at that point. And you know, I, we see your tears here, you know, as you're going through this, um, Simone. So first, I appreciate your transparency and being so honest with us, because I know that isn't easy. But I'm curious, with the tears, is it that you're reliving that moment? Or what is it that's that really- I'm so grateful. Yeah, these are actually happy tears. I'm so grateful to have a family that had such a beautiful response. Because once I went to rehab, you know, I had all kinds of girlfriends. And one of my girlfriends, she did a little bit of everything. She, like me, was an overachiever, top scholar. She was a national merit finalist. She makes sure everybody knows that about herself. And when she told her parents, they disowned her. They disowned mm. her. And she asked for help. And, and at that point, she was just, she was doing speed. And it was to study harder again because she would do her homework and she said her boyfriend's homework. And so I'm just so grateful that nobody ever talked down on me. Um, nobody ever, you know, discouraged me in any way. And so that is part of the reason why I'm so um, supportive to others. And I really encourage anyone who's watching me, I intentionally put my Instagram at on there. So if you're thinking about it, you know, you can message me because I had a wonderful experience and you can too. Like, I really, really love my life now because before I would say my prayers, you know, I'm a Catholic girl,
go to sleep, say my prayers, and I'd say, you know, Jesus, if you don't want to wake me up tomorrow, that's fine with me. You know, mm. you can take me in some, instead of somebody good like, you know, Whitney Houston or something, take me, you know. But, you know, obviously he didn't listen. But, you know, I am now at a place where I'm just like, who knew my life could be this happy? And I'm so glad I did it. Wow, Simone, whew. that is a powerful story. To even just you just sharing that in that moment, just saying, God, if I didn't wake up tomorrow, I'm okay with that. To now being at a place in your life where you're happy and you're in love, while well, I'm acclaiming, <laughs> and all of those different things. So let's go back to the moment you have the conversation with your mom. Yes. Did she say she had known? Um, was oh, she yeah. really, So she had started to realize it? Well, yeah. So this was in December of 2016. And maybe around May, um, I went to my sister's bachelorette party. And I had, and I was helping coordinate and I had taken so much Adderall that day. And I ended up getting into a fight with one of my relatives. <laughs> so I think she was pretty sure that um, at that point, because it, what I didn't realize is it, it has the same side effects as cocaine. My, mm. I later learned at rehab that it is just a prescription pill form, like cocaine, I guess you sniff. This, you pop it in your mouth. So it's a little earlier. We, jokingly, we called it like Caucasian crack at rehab. It, but um, we just, I would take the pills so frequently that my mood changed. So she had realized it for a long time. But my mom's thing is, it won't do any good until she's ready to get help. Similar to a battered person, you know, they're not going to leave that other person. If you force them, it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. So that was really good for me. And afterwards, my friends would be like, oh, I knew something was up with you on such and such day when you did this. And I was like, girl, if you would have told me, because no one ever complained about my behavior. And it was nutty. It was very nutty. And they should have. <laughs> You're like, they should have said, hello, something is going on. Right. Because so, I know that if two of my friends, you know, complain about something, there's probably something to it. If two or more people say it, there's probably something to it. You need to look into it. So I do wish that friends had said something earlier. Mm -hmm. But you know what's really interesting? Even as we're going through your journey, you said you didn't still even realize till you got to rehab that you had an addiction. What, do you think it was a denial or do you think it was, you just didn't realize that you could be necessarily addicted to this particular drug? Definitely, I didn't realize I could be addicted to it. I think I think I heard that you could, but because I, I knew that that was the only reason it was control a controlled substance as much as it was. But the thing is, no one ever tells you what an Adderall addict looks like. It wasn't on the, uh, concerns that are, you know, come with your prescription. It's not listed on there. They don't tell you you work really hard. You can do twice as much work. You can wash your baseboards and the opposite side of your ceiling fan. You know, they don't tell you any of that. So you're right. It was denial of that. And then not knowing what it would look like if you were addicted. But at that point, I was so exhausted with life. Shoot, I don't care what you called it. As long as you give me 30 days to catch my breath and tell me that for 30 days, I didn't have to deal with a client, a case, a nothing. Shoot, sign me up. I was like, if you got to strap me to a bed at this point, come on, let's go. So let's when you get to it, so I mean, first of all, I love your personality, Simone. <laughs> <laughs> Even in the midst of talking about something <laughs> difficult, you keep it entertaining. Um, but you know, when you get to rehab, when did you, when you realized that it was addiction, what went through your mind at that point? Oh, I said, oh, thank you, Jesus. I'm not crazy. I just mm -hmm. thought I was crazy. I had 45 minute talk with the psychiatrist when I first got there and I told him everything was going on. And at the end I said, doc, tell me the truth. I'm crazy, aren't I? He was like, no, you're not crazy. You're just addicted to Adderall. And I was like, really? He was like, it would be a malpractice for me to even give you a bipolar exam or those things because the amount that you were taking makes your mind behave just like a bipolar mind. Um, and so you can't, um, so I think I was just elated that there was a solution. Because remember, I'm just thinking I'm just depressed and life is terrible and there's nothing I can do about it. And he walked me through it to basically help me realize 
it was Adderall induced depression. So that his his um, uh, recommendation was if we take that out, you're not going to have the depression. You're not going to have the sleeplessness, which then causes hallucination, hallucinations, and then causes the crankiness, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I said, well, let's, let's do that. I'm with this. Come on, let's go. Wow. So you started on that journey. And yes. I think what's was really interesting about your story is that you went to an American Addiction Center for You went to our Florida. Outside yeah. Florida. So River Oaks, our facility down there. So what and I think a lot of people, when they think about treatment, they have a perception in their mind of what treatment is like. And what to expect? Yes. What, how, did that, how was that for you? What was it like versus what your perception or thoughts were? Well, first, first I flew there. They picked me up in the airport. Like someone is greeting you. Like, like I'm a celebrity, or like I'm one of those like fancy athletes at like a D1 school that's a top recruit. And they get my bags, and they're so they're so nice to me. And then I get there, and it's like a campus with horses. I'm thinking it was going to be like people like itching and scratching themselves, like in straight jackets. I'm just envisioning straight jackets with people tied to bed and screaming, and like talking in tongues. But it was beautiful. Girl, you're cracking me up over no, here. No, I did. I, like, like, oh, I mean, but that is just, that's, that. but a lot of people have that perception and it's not reality. No, right? because what I learned is, whew, amen, thank God for President Obama and that health care bill because now it's mandatory that rehab is covered under um, Obamacare. So guess what? Now they're putting more into these facilities and they're super nice because your insurance pays on your behalf, no matter how crappy your insurance is or how great. So my room was like one of the nicest hotels I've been to. You know, it was super nice. We had a chef, we had a private chef that made all our meals healthy, with like minimal sugars and all that bad stuff. I had a personal trainer, okay? A personal trainer and a masseuse. So it was like fat camp for depressed girls, you know, fat camp for addicts. So I got, I lost weight. I got my body together and I actually was able to find replacements, healthy replacements for what I found to be the benefits of Adderall. For example, working out and spending more time outside and doing more activities like that. So yeah, I, I actually recently, I told my mom, I said, gosh, darn it. I, you know, I know I nicked that addiction, but sometimes I really wish I could go back there just to have that 30 day vacation. <laughs> mm. So you just felt like it was a place where you could get away. Oh yes. You detoxed off the drug, which I know we're laughing about it, but it is a serious process of detoxing okay. off the drug and all of that. So what, how did treatment change your life? How do you think treatment changed your life? You get there, you, you know, you said you were kind of a mess and just going through so much and not sleeping to where did you, when you left treatment, what was that impact? So first of all, it was a very humbling experience. Yes, my drug of choice was Adderall, but I'm sitting right next to somebody who's smoking crack and somebody else who's, you know, a, an addict of heroin and a prostitute. We're all the same. Everybody, yeah. And it's every, at the core of it, it's all someone who has some trauma that's unresolved. So I think it was a very humbling experience and I really appreciated that. And then what was the other part of your question? Yeah, I just wondered, like, what, how did it change, impact you? Oh, life? yes. The other part that really changed me is that each day in the evening time, someone would have the chance to ch share their particular story of how they became addicted. And it was all kind of just very interesting trauma. And I think I was a very extremely judgy person before. And it just kind of lets you know everyone has a story. It's made me so much more patient more kind. I definitely used to be like a narcissist and that created empathy, like a level of empathy that I just cannot articulate. And then most importantly, it changed my life in that I got to do a complete reset. So I was able to step away from all of my cases and assess and analyze what I had on my plate. And what we came to realize is the amount of work that I had on my plate, the amount of cases, the amount of clients, it was inhumane for one person. 
So we got to take that off my plate. Because when you're away at rehab, you know, they don't let you keep your laptop every day. This is about you. So I got to get rid of the cases and the clients that weren't paying me. They had to go find somebody else um, and, or, you know, the different things that were stressful. So I got to literally get rid of all of that mm. and start new and say, OK, Simone, what makes you happy that you want to do as opposed to what you're doing for money? So what would you say, you know, for someone just looking at your whole experience, what would you say to someone right now who thinks, hmm, this sounds familiar? You know, the Adderall, I'm taking it. I don't really know. What would you say to that person? So first of all, I'd like to let them know, hey, you don't have to be Superman or Superwoman because that was my thing. I worked in a worked environment at these big firms where the solution for a toxic boss was give her to the black girl because black girls are tough. And so I was abused on a daily basis. And with Adderall, it usually comes from having too much on your plate. Mm -hmm. So I definitely say, assess what's on your plate. If you think it might be too much and that might be the cause, there's a good chance of that. And then secondly, talk to someone who loves you and ask them, do you think my behavior has changed? I think I might have a problem. And they're, if they love you, they're going to give you their true constructive feedback. And you have to receive that. And then if for some reason you don't feel like talking to someone you love, the other person I'd say talk to is the doctor who's prescribing it. Like have that candid conversation. Have it. Have it with that person because they know what it looks like. Because one of the interesting things, though, that I realized is this healthcare system is so interesting in America because when I came back home after rehab, I learned that because of HIPAA, your own prescribing doctor is not allowed to know that you went to rehab. Like rehab can't tell them. You have to tell them. So ultimately, it was something that I did. But anybody can talk to their own doctor. So talk to your doctor or talk to someone that you love. And you know, a couple of last things I just wanted to add in there is because I think this is serious for some people. You know, like you said, you had three coworkers or three colleagues that you knew yeah. who passed away from this. So someone may be thinking, oh, I can get over it. And in your case, you got help in time. You were able to rebuild your life. You said this was a reset, but that doesn't happen, you know, for everyone. So, yes. so to clarify, it wasn't quite in time. I've had serious effects. So one of the things that Adderall, overuse of Adderall does is it raises your blood pressure. As a result, I've had a lot of mini like strokes. So my memory is not as sharp. And it's something that I'm very self-conscious about. I'll be very self-conscious about because I'll be in a social setting. And you know, as black women, we change our hair all the time. And I remember I had a weekend, I had a weekend when I traveled with this girl group and I later saw the girl like six months later. She had a totally different hairstyle and I didn't recognize her. And she fussed me out. And I'm like, sorry, that's what happens. I was a drug addict. I can't remember everything. So the effects are real. If you start noticing memory changes, Definitely talk to your doctor because um, I miss my memory. I'm still smart. I'm still sharp. I still have to. I just have to. I have to date guys who are more patient because I will ask you the same question five times. And luckily, I'm dating someone who understands that and is aware and appreciates it. Yes. And, you know, I was going to, you know, I want to end on this, but uh, you, because you brought this up and I think it is very interesting because you were on a dating show ready to yes. love. And, you know, many people wonder when you struggle with an addiction, do you share that? You know, and when do you share that? And Rashid was on the show with you, who right, was your right. boyfriend or your boo. And, and so how did you navigate that? And what would you say in terms of being open and transparent, you know, with the person that you're dating? Sure. So I would say, don't share it until you feel like you and him are at a place where you want to pursue a serious relationship that could potentially lead to marriage. So not just a friends with benefits, mm -mm -mm, keep that to yourself. And actually what many don't know is 
Some people remember the truck date that I had on my episode with Rashid. That is when I shared it with him. Really? So that you heard it on the episode of the show uh -huh. with him that you were struck, that that was something that you struggled with. Yeah. And he asked me, he was like, well, what do you need from me to support you? And I said, you know, it varies. I said, but, you know, I've had struggles. I'm still on ADD medication sometimes. I don't always like to take it, but <laughs> because I'm scared, I want to make sure I don't get addicted. But I said, you know, one of the things that I'll need from you is I want you to take my medicine sometimes and allocate it to me. Um, and, and if I'm changing medications, sometimes I'll have mood changes. So I want you to be aware that that can happen. Don't let me get away with it. But just say, hey, I've noticed this. That's something you're going to have to work on. And he's really patient and he's okay with it. Because in the end, something's wrong with everybody, right? Something's wrong with everybody. It's a matter, though, of when you're dating someone who knows what their challenges are and then knows what they need to be supportive, then it's so much more manageable. Yes, definitely. And so you've already kind of told us this, but I want to end on this note. What is life like in recovery? Because I think people have, you know, you, I earlier said, you know, well, I was going to say sometimes people have misconceptions of what recovery is really like, but you also said it seems like you're living your best life now. So yes. I just want to end on this high note of what is possible. You know, you went to treatment at American Addiction Centers, you reset that button. And what is life like now for you? Oh, it's, it's so much fun. Life is like a party. I enjoy it. I try new things. Most importantly, I take it as every day is so valuable. And I live for the most every day. Even when I, when I dated, with dating, I would be open to different types and personalities because I just wanted to learn new people. I just wanted to have new experiences because every day was so precious to me. Mm. Well, that is, you've given us so many, Simone. First of all, your transparency tonight. Thank you for that. Absolutely. Second of all, you've given us so many golden nuggets for people out there who may not even realize about the dangers, the potential risks for Adderall. But then you also have been transparent about treatment and getting through this and having loved ones and support and just letting people know they're not alone and having someone they can turn to and being able to be transparent. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. And everyone, this is another episode of Addiction Talk. Go follow Simone. Um, she always yes. is dropping a lot of wisdom. Reach out. If you're thinking about going to reach out, to rehab, please reach out. I'll talk to you about different options, different things to consider. And I just want to cheer for you and support you. Oh, I love that. Okay, everyone, that's going to be do it for Addiction Talk. We hope to see you next month for another episode. Bye for now. <laughs>